Okay. Uh, a couple people asked for recording, um, but I also want, thank you, Jen, for reminding me of that. But I also wanted to let you guys know that as we talk about attuning with our spouses, that the, the error that we make is thinking, well, I don't do that. But actually studies have shown that most humans do that. We rank ourselves as better than average. And let's face it, sometimes in marriage, we rank our spouses as worse than average. So we say this about ourselves. I work hard and I deserve grace. Um, and then at the same token about our spouses, um, we, we put them in shadow a little bit more. And we say they're far from perfect and they, and um, my spouse doesn't deserve as much grace. And that's something that I would really like for you guys to, yeah, just think about for a minute, let that soak in. If you notice you do that, especially if you have any tendency toward an Enneagram four personality, which is the one that can be a little more uh, prone to lament and melancholy um, and victimization. So, um, and deep, dark feelings. So it's, it, we all can do it. Like I said, studies show that we all do it sometimes, but I also want to check in, um, to see if there's any questions. So I'm going to stop the share right now and come back to you for a minute and see if anybody has any questions. Um, first I'll check with Jen because she is, um, taking questions if there were any behind the scenes and I haven't had a chance to look, but she's asking right now. So any questions that you guys have? And if so, if you haven't asked Jen, if you want to raise hands, Jen, do you see anything yet? So no real questions yet, but the Encanto song is all stuck in our heads. So thanks for that. Um, also, I just want to let you know, we are international. So there are people from all over the world, Yay. literally it's awesome and so exciting. And a lot of people shared their types, which was super fun. And so no big questions yet, but we are looking for more questions. Okay. And I see that Wendy might have one um, about Encanto. My husband is going to kill me, guys. He's got it stuck in his head too. And he said, no more. So what am I going to do? <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> Just we raise your question, hand. Krista. Okay, but raise your hand if you're sick of Encanto. I just want to know who's like done. And then <laughs> it's okay if you are. Some people are done already. I tend to burn things out in my family. And even I have to admit it, my kids are about done because I like to play songs a lot. Um, okay, but I don't see that many hands going up. Okay, so what's the question that you have? Okay, so we have a question from Wendy. And Wendy, you're more than welcome to ask this, but I will read it out for her. So she said, this may be a head question, but why do we do this? As a one, she tends to think I'm the imperfect one, undeserving of grace. I heard that from somebody recently too. You're right. Statistically, it doesn't account for every single personality type. It just tells us that there's a, a tendency for all humans, but there are going to be some nuances and variety and Enneagram one makes sense that you're even harder on yourself. Um, now, interestingly, I don't know if you know your subtype or not. Typically one of the subtypes is a little bit more perfectionistic and within Wendy. And you probably know that that's the self-preserving one. So you might actually lean towards that. Okay. Yes. So that's probably why the other two types of ones might more likely be trying to change their spouse. So it's a good thing for you to remember. The opposite is that the error applies that you are deserving of grace. And really that's the spoiler is that everybody is because everyone makes mistakes. And one of the big things the coaches on my team know, and I'm so glad to see Catherine here too, another one of our coaches. Um, but we really are in that space of, um, of just even coaches until we're done until our last breath we're in process. And so I like that vulnerability of my coaches. And, and we all know that we try to, I hope you do the same thing that if you're having a struggle in your job or your marriage, that you try to say, Hey, I'm not in a good state and I'm not taking on more work, more clients. I'm not going to start um, something that's going to throw me over the top. I hope we can all be in touch with ourselves, not just attuning to our spouses, but attuning to ourselves to know, Hey, um, fundamental attribution error is getting to me. I feel really bad about myself right now. I probably need some time to just go and sit um, and heal. So if that's a healing space for you, um, do it. Do your self-care work until you have your affirmations loaded up and you feel better about yourself. 
yes, we're going to go through it little bits each day, but if you're really overloaded on like self-loathing and it's not just like a few days of hormones, um, then I think it's really important to stop whatever you're doing, whatever kind of work you're doing and do some soul care. And I even recommend making an affirmation journal at that point to just remind yourself of what other people have said about you over the years, collect cards, collect text messages, write them in the journal so that you can peruse it and build yourself back up and remember that you're worthy too. Okay. Any more questions before we move on a little bit? You're welcome. And I'm going to come back for some more questions in a little bit. So we'll, we'll get to those. Okay. All right. So the first thing I want you to do now in your chat, as we come back from this little break is I want you to celebrate a few things in order to attune to your spouse or partner better. Um, and if you're not married or with a partner, then I want you to just think about yourself or a close friend or a best friend. Sometimes people answer me on Instagram and say, this is me and my best friend. That's fine too. But celebrate three things in the Zoom comments um, about your spouse or partner and what you love about them. The truth is happy couples utilize these turn towards behaviors um, and find the good. So I'm gonna explain turn towards behaviors in a moment, but basically, um, you know, we have these little headaches. Um, that's why I wrote that little note to myself. We have these little headaches when we're feeling frustrated by our spouses and partners. Um, but if it's little, please try to remember that fundamental attribution error that I can really get on that partner and forget all the good they do. And if you can't think about what you love about them, then try to think about a trick for um, a lot of type ones when they get in this space is think about what somebody else would say um, about your partner. And I know what's going on in your heads. If you're annoyed right now, you're probably like, and it could happen with any type where you're like, Okay, but they don't know them as well as I do. Yes, but they do know them. So what does your child or a coworker or a family member like about your spouse or partner? And just celebrate that and write that in the Zoom comments because um, healthy couples are really good at doing that. We call those swan couples who are good at saying, I love certain things about my partner. And for instance, if they come home late from work, I'm going to interpret that in a positive way, most of the time. Like, I think that it's because they were working so hard, they're so diligent versus they must not care about me or respect me. Um, so that's a very nice way that couples that are happy really talk about um, just being healthy and, and not wasting time and just saying, look, I'm taking all my moments best as I can and I am making them positive. But of course, if we see huge issues over time, we, we have to talk about those. Um, the other thing happy couples do is they utilize those turn towards behaviors that you might've heard me talk about before. And those are from John Gottman, but in his love, love lab, he's studied how couples really turn towards each other when they're happy. So this Valentine's day and beyond, I want you guys to listen when your spouse talks to you. And I know that sounds very basic, but we do tend to listen to others better than our people. We do tend to. Um, kind of give them the short end of the stick. And we do tend to look at our phones and um, tune them out even in bed. Nowadays, this is something we're all learning together. Since the digital age started in 2007, we've kind of just as a conglomerate decided, you know, we're a human science experiment and we're going to just use and burn out these smartphones till our brain cells are fried. So something we're learning as a hyper-modern world is that we really do need to protect our, our marriages, our brains. And one way you can do that is you can even to do more turning towards behaviors, you can put that phone down and you can put it in another room or another much easier trick because we like our phones near us is to put it behind your laptop or your screen. Um, I'm tempted to do it right now, but I need it because Jen and I are communicating, but it really helps to be able to say, I am doing something intentional to give my spouse my attention and um, I'm going to turn it this over or put it out of sight that alone can help your concentration span significantly. There have been so many studies to tell us that even just putting it out of sight 
behind your newspaper or something makes a big difference. So I want you to remember, I wouldn't have said this 10 years ago, but I would know that turning towards behaviors and technology use are intricately tied together. So those are a few tips I want to give you. And then I want to go over a little bit about um, how you guys can align your instincts a little bit better. Most of you know that Enneagram is not just about types and Enneagram and marriage is not just about types. And in fact, you might have known that I've theorized that and many others as well, um, including Dr. Catherine Favre, um, that the instincts play perhaps an even bigger role than our types. So we have the self-preserving instinct and you can feel free to write these. I love to look at this later. And I know you guys like to see from each other's ideas. Um, what do you do for self-care? What do you do to replenish? Because that's important. And there is an order to this self-preserving. Um, maybe you're not a self-preserving type earlier. Wendy said she was, but maybe you're not. And um, I want to remind you guys that unless you put that oxygen mask on metaphorically first, um, then you're not going to have what you need to give one-to-one -one or as a society. So think about this Valentine's day. How am I going to make sure I have actually something to give? What are you going to do between, um, you know, now and then, but really ongoing to maintain this level of human dignity that allows you to have something to give. And for some of us, it's going to be looking a little bit less frumpled and um, frumpy is a better word, frumpled, rumpled. Um, and I think that that's, <laughs> that's a new word. I think that that's really um, a big one for couples that as I've been reading research, smelling nice, which we're gonna talk about in a little while, but some of the things that we do for self-care for ourselves might have nothing to do for our spouses. And that's okay too, um, because ultimately they're going to feel it if you're feeling joy. Yesterday, I could only fit in a five minute workout and my daughter was the same way. And we both felt a world of difference after just five minutes. So figure out what it is, whether it's a hot bath, a book. I love that you're sharing. Um, and then how do you show this to your spouse, which we'll talk about in a few more minutes. But um, what do you both love to do for love languages and sexual intimacy? That's important too. And, and we will get into that a little bit later. But I want you to be thinking about that and even sharing it a little bit now. That's the sexual instinct. And that's the one-to-one -one instinct. Like I took care of myself. And now I want to take care of my partner and me because we don't want to do all of our things apart. So what do we both like? And we try to lean in here and we try to say, talk to your partner or spouse and just say like, can we have a conversation? I know that you like this and I like that, but what do we both like? That's a really good question. And it shifts and changes. John Gottman has an exercise called love maps that I teach my students. And it's so important because you really need to know, like, what are some great questions to keep up with your spouse so that you know more about them emotionally than anyone else? So that's that sexual um, vibe that you want to have going on together. And then what do you both like doing together? A little bit more with the SX here is, um, you know, one of the things you might say is like a type four who came on our podcast recently, we love to talk about when we first fell in love. That's a way for us to reconnect again and again or just think about it. And um, I really like the idea of going to old places that you visited together and just trying to find new ways to be adventuresome too, because healthy couples um, aren't just always doing the same exact date night every week. And then lastly, that social um, instinct in marriage looks like, hey, I took care of myself and I'm taking care of my spouse and family. And here's what I love to do to give and what we love to do to give. And I put Bridge of Life because that's a wonderful adoption and foster care um, organization I like. Obviously, Meals on Wheels. I had a type two client tell me last week that when she does this, it just brings her such joy. A lot of you like to give to the homeless. Um, and just being creative together can help launch you. So um, I, I did add one more in here for those who are more self-preserving or quieter or five-ish. Um, and I'll go over the types super briefly for those uh, who don't know anything about them. But I do want to say that um, the secret giving is really nice for those who are just not wanting to warrant more attention and don't feel like they have as much energy. 
Um, so just make sure that in your marriage or your relationship that you're focusing on all three of these on Valentine's Day so that you have enough for the self-preserving and the one-to-one. Um, and even when you're on Valentine's Day, it doesn't, if you're burnt out, it doesn't mean you have to go serve on Valentine's Day, but it just might be a nice time uh, in the next week or two to just say, I'm going to make sure we talk about this. And I'll tell you, obviously, I think it's the right and good thing to do to help others. But I also want you to know that's research-based and the biggest cure, one of the biggest cures for depression is actually volunteerism. So it feels really good to serve and to give. Um, but sometimes I would say most people who come to me for counseling or coaching over the years, they're burnt out on that third one and they have to come back. And that's why I think there's an order to it. Um, and I think we fight in marriages a lot of the time about these instincts because I think one of them really is close to us and we feel like it's our saving grace. And one of them is pretty repressed. And then one of them is also kind of repressed because we're like, ah, oh, that's my second one. And I got that. But, but sometimes that second one, we're not doing the best with it. So it's good to watch for all three of this, these instincts in yourself and to have conversations with your spouse. If you have my Enneagram and marriage glow planner, we talk about these every single week and a pattern I've kind of noticed with Wes and I, and I'm going to come back for questions. And in just a minute here is I've noticed he is not doing um, consistently I'm not doing well in the SX. Like I thought I was, but looking at it, I'm like, I'm kind of skimping. I thought that was my second one, but social has been moving up. And then for him, self-preserving he's, he's tends to come up with a lot of reasons why that one is not, you know, as important. And we really do well when we're balanced. So maybe you can share in the chats too, which ones you struggle with, um, as well as ideas. Um, and I'm going to have a couple questions in just in case now and greet our newcomers. It's so nice to see you guys. Um, so anybody have a question? I see one already. And then before I get to that one, has there been anything waiting, Jen? No. So everyone's just been sharing what they do for self-care, which I think is wonderful that, especially if we give tips for our specific types, Wendy and I were saying we need to get out of the house as ones so that we can not see all the things that we have to do and yeah, just yeah. get self-care out of the house, I think is important. I love that Kristen, uh, Kirsten said paying for someone's food or coffee is a great way to do Ooh, that. I think that yes. is so beautiful just to do that. Um, and people just talking about whether they need time alone or with a spouse and beautiful comments on people's spouses. They were so differing and we have very long-term marriages here too, which is amazing. Um, and the phone comment about, um, Erica Badu having a song, I can make you put your phone down. Ooh. That is awesome. Oh. Like, I love that. I'm sorry, Katie. Like, I just love that because my husband's sitting here going, oh, maybe I should. I'm like, yeah, pay attention. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Now I want to hear that song. Oh my gosh. That is so cool. You're right, you guys. And that's why I had for those who came in early music on because it just sets the mood and it brings me right back to my heart. And a lot of us, like, I'm going to put that phone down. I like, I think her name is Sade, but I don't know if you guys have ever heard by your side. It's the most romantic song, um, to me that can just make me like, Oh my gosh. Oh good. I'm so glad you liked the playlist at the beginning. I was going to share my husband's special date night list, but I didn't get a chance to ask. I see that somebody's married 25 years. Yay. Um, and we're 26 years of dating tomorrow. So we both took the day off work tomorrow to celebrate that. Um, so tell me about the question, because there was a question that rolled through and I can find it if needed, or maybe it was already answered about instincts. Yeah. So we have a question here. Can your instinct change? I really think it can and that it does. Um, and I think that we'll probably continue to find ourselves going back to one from childhood, just different seasons, you know, and I think over this last two years, We've all, I don't know if you guys would agree with me, but I keep hearing it and I, I can see it kind of leaned harder into self-preserving in some ways. Um, but when I say all, I'm going to do this actually, because I would say my husband went the opposite. And so he is a social and he went harder into social. There were moments of flickering, self-preserving, he's medical. And so he would, sometimes I would see him like making sure we have different medications and he wanted to, but even in that, he was always taking that pulse oximeter, however you say that to friends 
And it was, who's got it now? I've got to give it to the next friend. So I think that we kind of go back to what feels safe for us instinctually. And for him, uh, social was always the way he survived as a child. So you might feel that and that's okay. But for me, I've noticed some dramatic shifts. And one of the great levelers that I think is fascinating about marriage, I feel myself in my head again, (laughs) but I'm I'm coming back down in a minute, Um, is that um, I think that we um, we really bring our spouses to a different place with our instincts, because when we were both so high up in our social, it was not balanced. And my daughter was talking about what if dad was with somebody who was more social, I don't think they would know how to settle down. And I'm like, that was me 10 years ago. (laughs) And so I think that it, you know, was a part of it. And now I appreciate the way he brings me back up and he really does ultimately need it and appreciate the um, self-pres, but as a, um, as a one who's social, he doesn't always feel permission. So I have to literally sometimes be like, you get to rest, you need to rest, and it is right and good to rest. Um, And then of course, as you know, with your spouses, sometimes they're not able to take our advice and that's okay. Cause imagine yourself, you don't always want to take your spouse's advice either. So we just say, okay, I gave you my best and I I hope that you'll take it. But we also have shadows together as a, a couple, which I've been exploring recently, that sometimes we can both be so into our instincts that we, um, that we miss the instincts that other people would, would value. So it's important to look at that. Okay. Um, we'll take some more questions in a minute. Um, and somebody is a little bit confused about the subtypes. Um, I can take another minute about that, but I also want to say Enneagram and marriage.com. I have a, a whole section called freebies and I have an entire workbook for you on subtypes so that you can understand that each of the nine Enneagram types also has um, three types within each type. And it just means some of the people are more survival oriented with self-preserving. Some of the people are more one-to-one wired and they really love to spend time one-on-one. This is a very basic explanation. And then some people are just so socially wired Um, and it just shows up differently with each of the types. Okay. Thank you, Jen. So save some questions because we'll take some more or you can send them to Jen. Um, And let's go back to our conversation. I am so excited to hear about the ways you guys glow together. The glow concept came up for me after I started to watch lots of couples of the same pairing show up similarly when I was doing coaching with them. I mean, very similarly, but it wasn't just like you read online, like, oh, a two and a five are this, or a three and a seven are this. It was like, they were becoming more like each other. And I was like, oh, hello. We all know this, that we rub off on each other and some of us more than others, but you are who you hang with, so to speak. And so I was realizing you are who you hang with, especially applies to marriage. So I've just started to identify the Enneagram glow as the ways you shine together at your best. Um, And then I started asking around to Enneagram experts, and I found that um, there were a few people that talk about overlays of relationships like parents and cultures. And you guys have heard um, France is a very four culture or German, Germany is maybe six-ish and one-ish. And you guys said you're, some of you are here from all over. So I'd love to hear um, what you think um, the different countries culturally have as an overlay. I'm very curious to know if anyone has an opinion about their country or this country, which I'm in, which is USA. Um, And then maybe you can even share in the chat a little bit about your family overlay. Like my kids come from a one and a seven dynamic. So the overlay there is we can tend toward perfectionism and high achieving. We can be very fast paced. Um, I'm just recently learning in the last few years to slow down a bit. So it's, it's that, but it's also specifically how you and your partner really do rub off. So the example I'm going to give you, and it's the one I often use is that a two and a five that are together. Yes, they're both relational and caring, but they start to rub off and a lot of twos start to become more introverted like their five spouse. And a lot of fives are brought out. And that same thing can happen in a five, seven. If you recently heard the podcast, one of my absolute favorite statements on the podcast was made where um, the five introverted husband said about his seven wife um, that now I think the wife actually said it. She said, it's not anymore that I'm dragging him out. It's a bringing because he wants to be brought. 
And that's a big difference between somebody who's just kind of just, all right, you're a one, you're a six. This is what I'll do. It's like, no, you've, they've bought into who you are. That's the glow. And now you guys are shining, not only because you're similar, but you're also shining out there um, with your combined gifts. So if you are a two, which who loves to give and help, and you're a three who loves to um, achieve, then you guys are probably going to be a big personality. And I call that one love out loud with a megaphone on the cover um, of that glow booklet. We have booklets for each of the 45 hearings. And um, I had the artist make that because I said, you know, when I work with two, three couples, they're usually in the public eye and they just have huge hearts for helping the world. And they have a great gusto for getting it done. And every single pairing has its own gifts. And beyond that, there's uniqueness. As I mentioned at the beginning today, we're all so unique. So I was very curious about the ways you shine at your best together. If you can share some of that, I will be reading that for my research, just qualitative research. I'm fascinated and don't, no answers are wrong. I'm not looking for only Enneagram type. Um, Amy Wicks had a comment on my post, uh, on my podcast this week, and it wasn't really about Enneagram. She's just like, when we sit down and we start planning together with our seven and nine, it's just amazing. That's our glow. So, so it doesn't have to be um, type based, but I want to hear about that. And you can say, this is our glow up too. When we're at our best, I actually have all these different relationship stages as well, because we start out with these early shines as a couple, and we're just shining so brightly and beautifully. And then we hit our darkness and our shadows later, and we have to learn to immerse ourselves in the work. So I also have a freebie, um, all about the stages of your glow, but that's just the basics about it. And I think that it's important for you on Valentine's day to say, how can we shine and glow together at our best? And I really want you to think about what your spouse likes here too, not just what you like. Um, and as I said, we're going to just go a tiny bit deeper to remind you um, that we, we want to start out with some self-preserving. And then um, one of the things that really struck me as I was processing, sharing with you this week was how do we not just get our self-preserving ourselves, but can we do that over Valentine's with our spouses? And the answer is, of course, yes, we can do some of our replenishing and refreshing that self-preserving instinct together. And for some of you, it might be literally grocery shopping together because you love that. Um, many couples I know like to get couples massages or uh, trade turns massaging each other. And I also wanted to say here, I might add this later to a little bit more, but that um, that SX category of the one-to-one -one instinct is not just variety and playfulness in your sexual intimacy, of course, whatever you're both comfortable with, you don't want anyone demeaned or punished or hurt, but, but it's important to, you know, allow yourself a little bit of variety and a little bit of like, Hey, let's do something new together. But scent is very important. And 80% of couples actually say they want to um, have their partner smell really good. That's a lot on a date night in particular. And then you might've seen my newsletter this week where I said, couples who take date nights together are three and a half times more likely to say they have a happy marriage, regular date nights of at least one every few weeks. So these are some really good ways for you to celebrate Valentine's day. Um, and especially, like I said, that scent one cannot be underrated because we can even tell each other's pheromones sometimes. And, um, and of course our Enneagram type work. So I'm going to talk to you in a minute about how to really um, work with your spouse when they get in a mood, or as my teen daughters would say, when they're a mood. Um, but I want to actually stop for questions in a minute here. Um, so I'll switch the slide and then I'm going to come back to you guys now for questions. Um, you already did that where you wrote in your gifts together um, and your joys. And I didn't ask about the shadows. You can write that in too while we're chatting. But I want to go ahead and come back to you guys and see if you have any other questions right now, too. Um, so go ahead and let me know if there have been any, Jen, or of course, you can ask them right now in the chat or even raise your hand and speak out loud. Okay. Does anyone have any questions that they just want to ask out loud or comments about what we've been talking about? I have a question, Krista. 
Sure. I was so curious about the song that you said that you loved and it was such a romantic song. Ooh, all right. Can Jen, can you look it up called By Your Side by S-A-D-E? It is so beautiful. And if you're, if you're on mute, then I welcome you guys. If you have a way to listen to the song while we are chatting, it's just going to bring you back to your heart. It is that amazing. Thank you. Yes. Like Sade. Okay. Sade, is that how I say it? Yes. <laughs> oh, I love that song. She's got a couple of beautiful songs. I mean, probably many more, but. Thank okay. you. Yes, of course. Anybody else have a question or a comment? Yes, Kirsten. I was going to say the person who had the question about uh, the, they read about one of the subtypes of their type and it sounded like them, but they then they thought they were someone different. Um, that really happened for me. I thought that I would just be a self pres because the kind of person I am, I'm a type two. And when I read the definitions, I'm like, the social like really describes me, not the, not the self pres at all. So mm -hmm. then I started really looking at myself and I'm like, am I a social? Is social what gets me in trouble? And then it totally was. And I learned something about myself I didn't know. And I kind of say that's like a backwards way of learning your subtype. Like, yeah. don't think about what the definition of the subtype is. Just read some of the great writers, you know, Krista, Beatrice Chestnut, who talk mm -hmm. about subtypes and see which one describes you. And then then go the other direction be like oh well that's describing the sexual or the self pres maybe that is what I am and then look at yourself from that direction and I find that to be that was really helpful for me wow that's really important thank you Kirsten did you um how long did it take you to figure out after starting your Enneagram work because I know a lot of people are on the journey and I don't want to overwhelm them well, in the beginning, I didn't really know anything about subtype really um, until I started reach, reading uh, Beatrice Chestnut maybe in the last few years. Um, I find that it can be really helpful though, because sometimes you don't, the subtypes do look really different. And sometimes it's hard to tell, um, you know, especially if you're the counter type, you may not look quite like your type. So uh, I think that if you're, if you're reading lots of things and you're not sure they can be, it, it can be really helpful. Mm, yeah. And just like I said, I like that at the beginning too, I said, make sure you don't overwhelm your spouse and overly type them as the one thing, the one gift, uh, the best work you can do with your spouse. If they're not that into the Enneagram is you can talk about the changes you're noticing in yourself and you can be curious out loud about that versus self-condemning. I don't want you to go at it by this way of like, I'm so bad. And I think we've all done that trying to get our spouses at times to buy in. We're like, I'm so bad. This is what I do wrong. And it's like so enticing for them because of that fundamental attribution error. Like, you know, your mistakes and that's good. And it's humble, but you don't want to totally beat yourself up. So just make sure that you, you take this all in slowly. If you're just learning Enneagram for yourself and you don't throw it at your spouse, but that you more come at it with curiosity, like, Hey, you know, I noticed that I was really achieving all last week. And I don't know if I even gave myself any time at all. If you're a three, you know, or if you're a five, you might say, you know, lately I've been just going in my castle and uh, rolling up the moat and I feel so alone lately. And I'm just reminded of that with my Enneagram work that, um, that that's not me at my best. Those are ways that spouses feel like, oh, this is a cool tool that you found versus I learned that you're a six and I'm tired of this, you know? Um, so it's, we've, we've all done stuff like this. We will continue to make mistakes, but it's good for us to learn together. Um, so let's go on with a little bit more learning and then we can come back for some more convo, but keep the conversation rolling. I love that you guys are side chatting because I am a side chatter when I'm in a group. Um, and I feel like you get sometimes a little extra that way. Okay. So the types in healthy conflict, I said that I wanted to take you guys through some conflict diffusing so that we didn't just, you know, roll into the heaviest of conflict management style tips. We'll do more of those in March on the podcast. Um, but tonight let's just talk a little bit about each type in terms of caring for each other when we're in conflict. And what I'm really going to ask you to do is, and feel free to add to what I'm saying 
validate it, um, even disagree with it. I'm from a family of debaters. That's fine with me. Um, but I really want you to just, this is a tip for you, for your spouse, just one or two for each type. So the perfectionists are um, the one, they're also called reformers. And um, there's a few other titles we might give them. But in general, this is a group of people who like to um, work really hard and um, not cut corners and take themselves very seriously. So if you're going to uh, want to diffuse a conflict with the one, you're going to want to open a metaphorical window in the room versus attacking or criticizing. And we might say don't criticize anybody, but especially a one because they're very self-critical, as somebody said earlier. So bringing it up and bringing it lighter is a great tip for your one. Number two, type twos are helpers and givers. And they're very sensitive and also very hardworking, not totally unsimilar to one. So if you have a conflict with the two, make sure that you pad in um, what you love about them and praise them and spend quality time with them and then let them know that you'll want to spend even more time with them once they address the issue. And that way they know you're not leaving or abandoning them. That same thing can be said of the three that they can come off as harsh um, and they are achievers and performers, um, but they really are soft underneath and very sensitive. So you want to make sure if you have a conflict with the three that you really let them know that you're not going anywhere and that you're here for them. Um, and you might even ask them, hey, can you spend a little time in feelings with me and even just give them a bit of a heads up? And usually a three will say, I want to talk about it right now. And you could just say, let's take a pause then. And I love you. If you're with a type four, they, they go to those places a lot of con conflict within and really thinking and contemplating a lot. Um, and they will usually take your advice very seriously. But a tip I have for you is if you're trying to ask a four spouse to change and shift, understand that they're also quite critical of themselves and they might take it into self-loathing even. So it's important that you let them know they're not the worst. Just even saying that, like, you know, thank you for being so great. This is one small thing that I've noticed about you, but you're such a tremendous person and I will never forget that. Don't ever think that I'm saying this because you're bad. Um, that helps. And they also will need a few minutes to go away and try not to chase them. They'll be okay if you give them that. A type five is going to want you to keep it logical as much as possible. Um, and they're going to want you, if you've got a little conflict diffusing to do, to, um, to be honest, to be open. And they'll probably, um, if you're asking for time and attention, they might fight you on that. But a helpful tip for a five is actually to say what I said in the example earlier, which is remind them that when they give to others, it, they're, they're, they're actually helpers deep down. And so um, they don't have as much energy as a two, but they really do like to give. So you might say, can we figure out a compromise? Because there's a lot of synergy that comes from entering into life and giving, whether it's with me or I'm asking you to do something socially. Can we find a way to do this that's going to help you too? Or you might also uh, you know, work out some conflicts by giving them compliments because they worry about them not really having anything to give deep down. So build your fives up. Type sixes, I want you to understand that they really um, love to talk about deep issues with you. And they might need some time um, to think. It's hard for a six to do this, but it's in good to encourage your six to say, once again, like I said with the two, I'm not going anywhere, but I, I do need a five minute breather. Um, or 30 minutes, or I need to get some sleep tonight, but you're a priority and I'm, I'm not leaving you or abandoning you. We're going to talk about this tomorrow. And then when you do talk about it, understand your six is reactive and their emotions mean that they care. So try not to read that as um, being abusive. Now, if they are being abusive, tell the six, Hey, this is tending toward way too much. And of course, if there's, excuse me, name calling you, you have to say, Hey, I know you're in fear but you're losing me here. So it's okay to be honest with the six. They want to move closer to you. They're very loyal. With a seven in conflict, it's best to um, give them a small warning about it. Like I said, with three um, to say, like, I have something to talk about with you, but I want you to know that um, 
instead of just saying we're together forever, that actually can make us sweat a little bit. Um, we want to be together forever. As you know, I've just said, I've been with my husband 26 years of dating and I, I plan to be with him always, but I, that doesn't help me in a conflict if I'm mad, like, or wanting freedom to hear, we'll always be together. I want to hear, um, we'll find a way to work it out that you won't be in captivity. Um, so that's what your seven wants to hear is, you know, please make me feel like I have room to move because movement has been very healing for me. Um, type eight is really going to want direct logical. Let's work this out. Let's be practical and let's be honest. And of course, like I said, with some of the other types that, that want to work it out directly, make sure that you're both using language that is respectful of one another. That's really important. It's okay to set a boundary with your eight. If you think, Hey, you're getting in my face too much. Can you please take a few steps back? Um, it's coming at you from a love. They're reactive in their loving stance, but, but just say it's, I know you mean this as love and care, but I need a, a few moments and I love you. I'm not going anywhere um, ultimately, but I need a few minutes. So that's a good place for you to work with your eight and conflict. And like I said, during this whole Valentine's week, I'm hoping you don't start a fight over Valentine's day. I, I really noticed in the research that, um, about date nights and things that it's not the best idea to bring up stressful topics on a date night. If you've gone through my release program, you know, that I, I, my coaches know this, I really stress, you know, you have another 115 waking hours of the week to do that. Um, so try to not do that. And then with type nine, um, they just need to be encouraged to not leave the conflict. They're so, um, tendency, their tendency is to believe that if they do talk it out with you, that the relationship won't be as strong. And people always give a pretty quick answer like, yes, it will. But the truth is a lot of times with nines, it isn't as strong because people don't listen to their nines. So if you're going to say to a nine, stay here, don't leave, then listen. That is your best tip for a nine. They're very straightforward, fair, very loving. And that is a very simple type to work with if you can just listen. Their requests are not going to be much um, they are going to be something, but they're not going to be too much, but they do love their comfort. We had the rain here today in Florida, as I was sharing. And, um, I asked the kids, can you come bring the groceries in? And my, <laughs> my nine went out with her Birkenstock sandals and, um, these very comfortable sandals. And then she also had on, um, I think the Sherpa, the family Sherpa, cause we don't have many coats here in Florida. We didn't get our winter coats out. Um, and then she also had an umbrella and I was just like, you are in your comfort, aren't you, honey? Um, so the nines will want comfort, but you say, please stay with me. I promise I'm going to be a good listener to you. Okay. So that is as far as I want to go into conflict tonight, because this is our Valentine's conference. Um, but remember this, we're, we're going to mess up sometimes. It's not about perfection. It's about intention. Um, but you actually have to try. So intention, meaning I'm thinking about it, I'm contemplating and I'm taking some steps. Um, and that's, that's, if you're doing that, I'm so happy with you. I am so thankful for you in the world, shining out that beautiful, hopeful glow. As we read from the beginning, moonlight drowns out all, but the brightest stars. And that's you guys. Um, okay. So we're going to take a pause to relax in a minute, but before we do this, I'm going to ask questions because if I ask questions after we relax together, then you're all going to be asleep. So I'm going to come back to you really quick. Um, and we're going to just see if there's any questions from what I just shared or comments, or if Jen wants to share any of the comments that have been shared. So we have a question about someone who is asking if you can briefly describe each type of the Enneagram for those who are not as familiar with it. Um, well, I, yes, I can do a tiny bit of that. Um, and or I can I put it in notes. Would that be more helpful? That would be perfect. Yes. Um, and then also, we also have an, a 40 page Enneagram and marriage workbook at my uh, website, enneagramandmarriage.com. And I go into depth on each one of the types there. And I have podcasts on each episode and Jen and I are in a series of podcasts on each one right now too. So thank you. You could even go and find one of the um, worksheets and just put it all there because I love the question. I think people, some of you are like, I think I know my type, but I'm not sure. And then some of you, um, everyone probably needs to just at least hear it once again, that sometimes even people who have thought they were a certain type for a while have shifted. Like Kirsten, you said you shifted 
um, subtypes, but maybe some of you have shifted types too. You know, so it's good to process that. I know truity.com has a pretty good test that they worked with from Beatrice Chestnut. The only reason I say pretty good is because we all know um, who have been studying Enneagram for a while that when you really see the types, um, we have it on our website, a very quick, succinct way of seeing some of the core fears, core motivations of the types. Jen's going to be sharing too. Um, it's like, you know, you can't really take a test to get there. You have to really resonate with it yourself when you see, uh, oh, I read about this type or um, I had a coaching session, or maybe I took a test and looked into it a little bit. Now I found my type. So just because you take a test doesn't mean that's your type. Um, and that's important to look at because maybe you've been kind of going, this is my main area for growth for a while. And it's still important. I'm glad you're learning about that type, but maybe there's another type that you're even closer to and you've had even more issues going on. So that's why tests like Truity's test are quite helpful. Also stay tuned for Truity because there's something huge coming out with them this week and they're going to be on our podcast soon and it's about love languages. So I'm super excited to learn more with you guys about the new findings on the number of love languages out there and um, what they are. So that'll be fun. Any more questions for right now? I don't think so. Okay. You have more of a comment. Okay. And I didn't see it, but, um, I can't get distracted on it. I cannot squirrel. <laughs> I'm a seven. There's FOMO going on. <laughs> so Jen, is there anything I need to know before we relax together? Okay. Hi, Krista. Oh yeah. Hi. I have a quick question. Sure. When we are in arguments with our spouses, do we tend to argue from maybe the arrow that we are in stress in? Like if we throw, I'm a type one. And if I go to stress to a certain number, is that the area that I'm kind of arguing from as far as mm. communication or mm -hmm. how does that play into things? Oh my gosh. All-star question. I asked this question of Beatrice Chestnut and Uranio Pias, and I loved their answer because it resonates with me. And I, I bet it will with you too, when I share it, um, we can argue from lots of different points. We could argue from, if you're a one from that four space where you're like, I'm victimized, um, fours tend to get stuck in envy and self-loathing. It could be from that state of jealousy right there, or you could be, um, a sexual one, which is that sexual instinct I talked about. And you could be arguing from a place of I'm jealous, um, in a different way. I'm just jealous that I'm working harder than you. And it's taking on a different vibe because maybe, um, maybe there's a person that you're thinking, I thought you were going to change in all these ways and you didn't. And, and sexual ones really like to change their partner. Um, and then there's vices for each type. Um, and there's places like you might be so caught up in your anger and it's not as much about jealousy or sadness as anger. And that's one's vice. So we could come from lots of different places. And that's why if you do deeper Enneagram work, it can be helpful to kind of pinpoint where am I coming at, but I know how complex and overly complex the Enneagram can get. So I'm going to bring us all to a pulled back view for a second and say, if you just focus in on instincts, that helps quite a bit. So, um, in terms of, Hey, I'm a one, um, if you could just at least ask yourself, do I seem to be coming from a place of wishing that my spouse were more social with me and, and showing me off more in public and going places more, do I seem to be coming from the self-preserving? Like, I don't feel like my spouse is saving enough money for us. I don't feel like they're being responsible with our time or our, 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 yeah, our time, or am I coming from a place of, like I said, sort of that four place of jealousy, um, the sexual instinct. Um, so I think that it's, I hope I didn't confuse anybody too much there, but I think that that's a good space to start when we're asking, why am I mad at my spouse? What's at the core of this? And then I think it's okay to say to your spouse, I think I'm coming from this place and here's why I think so. And you can go all the way back to childhood. If you want, you can say, you know what? I survived this way. My family line all through generations has survived because we have 
remembered to take care of ourselves, or we have remembered that society will help us when we're falling apart, that our church lifted us up at some point, or we fought in a war together when our people were being bullied and we needed each other. Um, maybe you're Jewish and you're coming from, uh, you know, some of our family said that the sexual instinct, that one-to-one is what preserved them through the Holocaust. There are so many different dynamics that family stories, that their narrative is told generation after generation. And then we typically find a spouse who has an opposite instinct. Um, so it throws us off so majorly because they're like, that's not how you survive. Well, the truth is you picked them so that you could add to your survival. And so when you talk about that with them, there's more of a buy-in on their end. Cause you're like, Hey, I'm stuck in my instinct and you probably are too. Is there a way that we could balance out here a little bit better? I hope that's helpful. That was a lot, but, um, I I'm glad. Yeah. I hope it was helpful. Um, let's go into, we are in our heads a bit here. So let's go into some lovely Valentine's day relaxing. And if you want to put on that Sade song by your side, while you're doing this in your homes, you may, um, you don't have to do this with us, but we're going to take about five minutes to relax. And I like to do this in my classes too, so that when we're taking in a lot of head information, I will read a relaxation exercise over you. Um, and then you can kind of allow yourself to center again, and then we'll come back to some more sharing, but this is from John Gottman and Gottman is the number one marriage researcher in the country. So I've been using this relaxation technique with clients for about 15 years and it's, it's nice. So I'm going to go ahead and let you either read it or just do it with me. Um, so first of all, I'm going to have you get comfortable. I'm going to take off my jacket and just go to my, um, uh, it's, it's kind of uncomfortable. Um, so I'm going to get relaxed with you guys and you might, um, start with me by, by just getting control of your breathing. And I'm going to start with massaging my shoulders, but if there's something on your body that feels tense or tight, I want you to just really pay attention to that first. And also know that you can close your eyes or you can leave them, um, leave them open if that's more comfortable and relaxing for you. But whatever you do, you should know that when you're flooded, you will find yourself either holding your breath or breathing really shallowly. So you can just relax for a second, super comfortably and take some deep, regular, even breaths. Hey. And try to mute your, try to mute your screen if you can for us, just so that we can have quiet um, and, and, um, and just take some time to really take some regular, even breaths. Inhaling and exhaling. And if it helps, you can also say to yourself, four seconds in and four seconds out. Some people even like to visualize a square. That as they go up, they're breathing in and then they're moving across out and then down in and then completing the square out. And now I want you to find areas of muscle tension in your whole body, not just the one area. And starting from um, your legs, I want you to just notice, have you been clenching your legs, your feet, are they falling asleep? And just pay attention and you can rub them just to bring that grounding back to things. And then move up to your torso. And, and you might want to tighten that for a minute. And just if some of you need to stand up, I'm going to place my arms above and allow myself a really nice stretch right here. And just, um, just allow myself to notice arms needing a bit of attention. And if you see something that's really tight, like your shoulders, you can clench it for a few seconds and then release it. And you're going to want to make sure that you also um, continue the deep breathing while you're doing this. 
and then move to your neck in your face. And if your hands are clean, which I have my six wing, we call it an Enneagram world where I want to be careful. If your hands are clean, you can massage your face and your temples. If you want your jaw and just let the tension flow out of the muscle group, get yourself feeling a little heavier. This is something you can bring to your spouse too. Like I said, this comes from the number one marriage researcher. So you can share it with them tonight or on Valentine's Day. And now I want you to just imagine that you're feeling the warmth. We're in the middle of winter. It's cold right now in most parts of uh, this side of the world. I don't know what it's like where you're at, but, but right here, I just want you to picture warmth. And just imagine the sun shining its rays on your body. And now I want you to imagine a comforting place. It might be a forest. It could be a beach, a meadow. I like to picture a beautiful, lush, green, almost rainforest and um, a beautiful home with glass walls inside. I'm inside and I can see and I can go outside. I have that freedom to come in and out. Whatever your beautiful imagery, I really do want you to put some, some color to it. What does it look like? Is it calming muted colors? Is it bright colors that invigorate and refresh? And think about what it even feels like and smells like there. Refreshing, beautiful. If you're in a good place with your partner, I want you to just picture them right now, smiling and joining you there. And just allow yourself to enjoy that thought. Maybe it's even a place you want to go to together and you just don't take much time to let yourself even remember it exists in your busy work week. And just take a couple more deep breaths. And then I want you to come back to us when you can. And I'll come back to the screen in a minute too here. I'm gonna get my next slide ready. But I'm gonna come back and ask you guys, um, give me a high five or raise the hand if it was helpful or write in the comments if you wanna tell us about the place that you pictured. And I, I bet some of you are like, that was a nice conference and I'm done. <laughs> and so that's okay. Um, but I also have more for you. So I hope you can stay. Um, but I love that we got to do that together because that's important for our bodies and our self-preserving instinct. And we come more refreshed back to our spouses when we've taken some time to truly relax together. So does anybody have, oh good, I'm so glad it was helpful. Anybody have any questions before we move on to talking a little bit about date night fun? Oh, I love hearing that. I'm going to peek just for a second. Oh, honeymoon in St. John. Oh my goodness. Hotel balcony overlooking the beach. Oh, that sounds lovely. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh. Ocean Cove. I've never been, but. That sounds just, just beautiful. Is that in California? Oh, I love California. I'm hoping to go, um, this July is my plan. So I'm hoping to experience some more California. We were engaged there and I remember La Jolla and Santa Barbara, but I've never been there. I know you, um, some of you go Northern California. Oh, so you, yeah. So you love the beach too. I love that Jen. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about a fun date night idea I have for you guys. I have a few little things just to jog your memory for Valentine's Day. And you can also tell us, please, I am one person, you are many. So share because your spouse doesn't know anyone in this group. So you might take one idea from her, one from him and come up with something unique. Um, that's just, you know, and you put your own spin on it too. 
Um, so make sure that you guys are, yeah, just sharing ideas about date nights as I share. Um, and I know you're also still sharing about gosh, what you did to just enjoy some relaxation. Um, so thank you, Paul, for sharing too. I'm so glad to see that. Okay. So some Valentine's date ideas. The first thing I say is lower expectations because I am celebrating Valentine's day, but I also understand that it's a very hallmarky, um, high stakes holiday. And just like the teens have to deal with these hefty promposals, it's too much pressure. So let's take some pressure off already and say that it's a win. If you literally watch the office and laugh your buns off while you eat chocolate. Okay. Like that's awesome. In fact, that is the date night idea, <laughs> but let's, let's give a few others too. <laughs> and so, um, that's my first one though. The second one is you don't have to spend a lot of money. A lot of people think you do. And some of you adore going out and living large. So I'm going to encourage you if that's you get your reservations now, because that is not something you should wait on if you do want to live large. Um, but if you don't, um, Make sure that you understand that you can do a lot for under $20. And one of the ways, um, 20 US dollars can go a long way. One of the ways you can do that is you can literally eat dinner first that you're going to eat anyway. And that's not part of your date, but it's just like, hey, we already ate. Maybe we have kids and we had literally um, spaghetti and it cost us $5 at home with our kids to make that spaghetti. But we didn't even count that as part of the date because um, whether we have kids or not, we don't have to spend a lot of money. And we decided that we were going to buy a little treat for ourselves. So this is where I'm getting at with eat dinner first. So that's not part of the expense. Um, even eat leftovers if you want, but then make dessert nice. And one way to do that on Valentine's day, so that you don't totally burn out on just sugar high for five seconds. And then it's over like I did with cookies this morning. Um, and I don't usually do carbs in the morning because I know that does that to me, but I forgot. I truly forgot. I got so busy and multitasking as a seven that I forgot for a bit. Um, and I had to rest and take a nap, but try not to do that on Valentine's night where you don't balance a bit because I don't want you just totally falling asleep. Um, and how you can do that is you could say, we're going to do, um, fruits, nuts, and chocolate. We've got a little bit of fat there. We've got a little bit of carb there and just a tiny bit of protein from the nuts. And if you're allergic to nuts, obviously no, but that costs you about $10 right there, maybe 15. And then the rest is basically um, getting a drink or sharing a drink um, at a Starbucks or a local cafe. If you're, you're like, hey, I want to go out, get a playlist going. Um, from just your own ideas, or you can go to our Instagram. We have a bunch of music favorite songs of different Enneagram types saved under one of the highlights. Um, you can also ask Jen and I can share, um, I can end up sharing Wes's playlist because he has a really good date night playlist that he's been honing over the years. Um, and I don't like to listen to it when I'm not with him because I like it to be special. Um, but you could do that a playlist a very special dessert that's not going to burn you out and make you fall asleep. Um, and then you could have a nice drink with it. And that's $20 right there. And then the, the last thing I add in here is, um, and I hope you're starting to add in some of yours now too, that you're hearing mine. Um, we did this during pandemic and it was a really good one. Um, we did, we used to take dance lessons and even hold a Valentine's dance for my counseling center. Um, but then when pandemics come, um, my husband had the kids uh, kind of maitre d' for us, and he had me get dressed up, and we did dancing lessons just from YouTube, and it was a really special date at home that I'll never forget, and I think it was a lot to ask of our kids, so, you know, whether you have kids or not, don't get lost on that fact, um, but you can do something like that, oh, or a poetry reading from poetry.com where you can just say, you know, I'm going to look up something beautiful from a gorgeous poet that I never would normally take time to look up. You could go Shakespeare, you could go Browning. Um, you really can look at favorite quotes together. 
Um, some people like to make homemade gifts and there's a million ideas on Pinterest. So I'm not going to get lost in that, but I just wanted to give you something simple, very, very simple and have you guys share some date ideas also. But like I said, if you want a reservation and to get dressed up and to do something nice, don't wait to make the reservation. Let your spouse know you're thinking about them now, even, and don't just say Valentine's day is hallmarky who cares because it's a day to show love and there's a lot of social pressure. So even though I don't love that and I want you to keep your expectations low so it doesn't become a big fight, I also want you to still try. I want you to remember intention, not perfection. Um, I also wanted to share this wonderful Song of Solomon, a couple of little verses because um, not because you have to you know, have a faith life, but Ancient poetry is beautiful. And whether you take it as a faith life or not, I love this Song of Solomon, um, this uh, biblical line. And I actually read the whole book yesterday when I told you guys at the beginning, I said I was so in my head, research, research, research. And I was really reminded, go into your heart, Krista, um, with, with this group tonight. And I love this quote here. Um, and I really thought it emphasized that even thousands of years ago, it was, it was important to smell nice. It says in the fragrance of your breath, like apples and your mouth, like the best wine, it goes down smoothly for my beloved flowing gently through the lips of those who fall asleep. Another part of this book that I wanted to um, remind you guys of was don't wake my beloved, let my beloved rest. And I thought that that was really beautiful in the self-preserving realm of really just understanding that your spouse needs good quality rest. And that could even be part of your Valentine's day where you might say, I drew a bath for you, or I want you to go take a little nap right now, because I know that you've had a long day or I, I poured you a glass of wine. Now, if wine makes your spouse fall asleep or if they get angry and they just, you know, it's not a good mood for them, then no, but whatever is their motif, I think it's important that you're thoughtful about coming at the date rested and with health. And my husband was really helpful to me on this for, um, we're going to be having some time. We've never actually gotten to see my assistant, Jen in person. We do everything via zoom because she's in North Carolina and I'm in Florida, um, but we're having a double date together this Friday night because her and her husband are coming to Florida. And uh, he said, you know, you're going to be talking with Truity. You're going to be um, having another meeting with a client and you're going to be with our kids when it's time to get ready for Jen. Can you give some time? Can you give some time and rest so that you're not just running to our date? And so three sevens and eights can really struggle with that, where we just kind of run and we're future oriented. So if that's you with me, take some time, let yourself rest. And then whoever you are, understand, especially if you're with a type one um, who is very sensory oriented, that, that sometimes scent can be a make or break where they might say, you know, I really liked this date night with you. Um, but I smelled you so strong and it was a turnoff. It, it turns out, um, I'll share something interesting. I'll come back to you guys, um, in a minute here, but, um, but that men really don't mind typically, um, or those who are attracted to the feminine scent, even if it's very powerful, it's not usually a bother if it's a pleasant scent to them. And for some, it's not perfume. It's the cleanly smell. Um, but whatever it is, you can pour it on, um, for men usually, but for women, they prefer a masculine scent, but something that's too heavy is a big turnoff. So the ax body spray, you might need just one squirt. <laughs> that's all I'm saying, but you can tell us if you have favorite scents that you love and even share um, what your Enneagram type is like, Hey, I'm a one and I like woodsy or I'm a four and I really like exotic smells. Um, it's fun to talk about that. There's not been that many studies of scent and Enneagram type that I've seen. Um, sometimes we get too anecdotal and it's probably just for fun, but, but it is for fun. That's why we're here tonight. And so I'm going to come back for questions in a minute here before I read a little bit more poetry. Um, and chat with you a little bit more, but anybody have any thoughts or questions 
since we've been talking about date nights and how to make it a really special Valentine's night or about scent or anything we've just discussed. Krista, I just have to say we're having so much fun in the in the notes over here. My husband and I are having just a fun time laughing over here. Yeah, he's over here. He's trying to hide over here, like in the corner. But I keep bringing him in. A Hello, bit. everybody. Hello. I'm trying to drag him into it, and I'm trying to get him to take little notes and pay attention. But we're just having a great time in the chat and just laughing and just enjoying it. But there are so many great comments in here that I just have to read one out that Katie wrote about having big yes. expectations um, about having you know what Valentine's Day should like should look like and how we kind of release need to release those expectations. And it just brought me to a point that. I was thinking about is, you know, we're not in our spouse's head. And so, and they're not in ours. So we need to share what our expectations are and our desires and needs beforehand, and then also contribute to make them happen. So if I want this beautiful Valentine's day date, he has no idea that I want this beautiful date. He might be thinking something totally different. He's right. like, we just need to get the kids to bed and watch a show and eat ice cream. I'm like what? That is so not what I had in my head. But I need to be fair and I need to share that with them, but I need to make it happen too. So like, what is my contribution to it? And as a one, I want to do it right. Like Wendy noted, yes, of course, but I just need to make my expectations known. I need to let him know what I want. And then I keep asking him like, what do you want for a date? And that's when he came up with, he wants to have this weekend, we're going to go to Florida and see Krista. Hi, and we're going to have a picnic on the beach for one of our date nights this weekend. So yeah. we're excited about that. You guys are going to have so much fun and you're kind I of, I know we have four days kid free. Like this is the best Valentine's day ever. This like never, <laughs> happens, never happens. Literally oh. we have three kids. We have a puppy who just got spayed today. Like it's crazy in my house. And this is just out of blue and it's Chris is a huge bonus, but this is going to be wonderful. So I hope everyone has some type of Valentine's day plans, but just let your spouse know even what you're it's thinking. It's sweet and simple. Yeah. Yes. It's about yes. the time together, not about what you're getting each other. Mm. Yes. And um, for those who have very particular needs or somebody says, I don't like surprises, that is something that is nuanced for us. So if we do have those, we do need to make them clear. Um, and that doesn't mean that we're bad or wrong. It just means I'm maybe I'm stressed sometimes in the week and I really want to have a special night with you. So can you make sure you either don't wear that cologne or you do wear it or that we do go here, or that we don't go here or that we don't see this person or that we do, you know, so these kind of little things can make or break. But if you're going to give 10 things, your spouse is probably going to be overwhelmed. So try to keep it down to about one or two. And just like, hey, what are a couple of things I can keep in mind for you? Because we have time for that right now. And um, I mean, if you're together long enough, which we have been now for that many, 26 years, and we started dating February 9th, um, and Wes gave me this beautiful um, overture, the first, we were 16, and I remember flowers were delivered and balloons into my physics class, you know, I kind of like got spoiled and I want that now every time. <laughs> and so it's kind of like important to say that, but if you're together long enough, I'm just going to be totally honest. We have our good Valentine's days and our not so good, right? Like some of them we do better than others. And, and the same goes for me. I've made beautiful little coupon cutouts sometimes. And other times it's like, you know what? Let's be intimate tonight. That's the gift. And it's like, you know, different years, your spouse would value one more than another, you know? So just be creative. And like Rob said, don't put too much pressure um, on the hallmark aspect, but don't ignore it either. Okay. So I'm going to read um, any other questions that anyone has right now. I love that you're sharing, but uh, Jen, I don't see any. Do you? Okay. I want to make sure I give our, our coaches a little chance who want to share a bit about themselves as well, but I'm going to finish up with a few more comments together. Um, I want to make sure that you guys remember this other beautiful poem from the same book, Song of Solomon, Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. Um, Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. I mean, that is just stunning, that kind of poetry. And it made me think of you guys and how some of you would actually like to write poetry to your spouse. Um, I would love to hear that you did that. If you shared poems with me, I would love that. You know, I like the, the movie, The Notebook. My daughter and I just recorded a podcast for you guys um, about where we analyze the notebook characters. We'll put it out sometime this month. 
but um, of course we did in Canto too, <laughs> but um, super quick. But basically, um, if you've ever seen the movie or read the book, you know that in the notebook, they're quoting Walt Whitman. They're taking time to learn from the greats and to share this beauty with each other because romance is extra. And when you think about marriage, Yes, practicality is important. And some Valentine's Day, we just want somebody to do the dishes for us. But when we can really remember that to be romantic means to go the extra mile and that it was maybe even our first cause of marriage. In most of our cases, it was we were doing okay on our own, but we wanted somebody for this uh, spectacle, for this extra. Then we might feel like going to the extra mile and doing this. I know sometimes Wes and I have even gone to Barnes and Noble and just said, um, let's go into the poetry section and let's look because neither of us are going to want to normally do that, but it's really meaningful to take time to slow down and to be romantic. That is beautiful. And it is not just for the fours out there. Anyone can be romantic and do that. Um, so we're going to take some questions and everything in a minute, but I just want to share with you guys, um, just because I feel like some of you don't know your Enneagram type, some of you do, this is where you can find us. Um, and you can find us at Apple, Spotify, Amazon. Um, you can even now, if you're kind of doing a double screen, you can go to enneagramandmarriage.com and visit that I actually have a new um, freebie for you guys, as I said, where I put a ton of date night ideas onto uh, this worksheet so that you guys can not just learn from my two or three and even from the ones you're sharing tonight, but learn in an ongoing way because you're probably not going to save the chat from tonight. And you guys can just look together at this list and say, okay, we have a list and we're going to take a good peek at what it's really about. Now, if you are doing the Enneagram and Marriage Glow Planner that I also have, um, that actually has for this month, there are specific date night ideas um, for each and every of the Enneagram types. And so that is really a nice way to say, okay, um, I'm looking at my spouse. Here's tried and true tips. Krista has researched so many of these types over the thousands. Here's what they generally like. Um, that's there. And you can also listen to the podcast where I talk about what are the love languages generally of each type. So there's, there's lots of information for you. Um, if you're just kind of here tonight and thinking, I want to become an Enneagram and marriage certified coach. We have a new group starting this Thursday. Um, but we really, um, won't be doing this again till 2023, um, and then before I have anybody else from my um, certification come on and say hello if they want to, I just want to take a minute to find out if the, the person who wanted me to go through the types, um, if, you, if you feel like you are getting connected with that, because we do have enough time to briefly go through them, if not. Um, so I'm going to come back to you and then I'm going to let my class say hi too. But um, Jen, do we, did we already get that settled or do we need to go over those? In terms of the date night? Um, the types, the Enneagram types, just not. Types, so I linked the book. So I think that people could go check out the book and, and hear about, read about all the Enneagram types there would probably be useful, right? Okay. Yeah, I think so. And I have just a few minutes, so I'll go through them really quickly here too. Um, because that's perfect. I love that they have a long-term resource and we're really not done here till nine. So let's do that. And I just really want you guys to think now critically, if you're like somebody who's like, I already, um, I already have had, um, actually I'm going to let the coaches share briefly first, anyone who wants to share first, because somebody want, might want to hop off. But if you want to stay on with us, as I review the types, um, you might just say, I'm going to use the time to, um, to be thinking about Valentine's day intentionally before I turn this off and before I head back to my world. Um, so stay with us, even if you, if you can, and if you can't, that's okay too. Um, but I just want a chance to, um, see, raise your hand. If you're one of the inner circle for Enneagram and marriage, and you just want to have people get to know you. Um, okay, perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and have Christine share a little bit about herself first. Um, and I just asked you to unmute. Go ahead, Christine. Sure. Yeah, my name's Christine Wilford. I'm a marriage family therapist. I'm located in California. I'm an Enneagram coach. 
Um, I'm licensed for the state of California, so yes. I can see people in California, Northern California, but I can do telehealth. So any online sessions is, is um, I'm available for. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I really liked about Krista's group and, and this particular topic is it doesn't necessarily have to just apply to your um, spouse, although that's fabulous, mm -hmm. but it can also apply to any relationship that you have, like your boss or your kids or, you know, your mom, your family members all of that it just is really universal and so i think there's a lot of value for what you teach and what you bring and i think you're an excellent teacher um oh. yeah yeah awesome. and i love having you and um even those who are watching um our our inner circle um not showing their video they were texting me i love christine and i was like oh yeah oh. so you are loved too you're always a great favorite in the class and um you. can you tell everybody here what your type is sure my type is an eight and my spouse may or may not be in this class right now oh. um <laughs> So, um, yeah, I'm, we're an eight, nine, um, glow pair and we've been together. It'll be 20 years this, this year. And yeah. And the Enneagram has helped tremendously and, um, yeah, we use it all the time. It's, it's definitely a tool that's helped us with our kids and how to parent uh -huh. and just, you know, with our stuff and not take it personally when we trigger each other and understanding also how to leverage what knowing like who you're, who you are and what your strengths are and what your, what your strengths are not and what the other person can bring, um, ex, you know, especially me being an eight and my nine spouse um, can help me to navigate through some very tough terrain of situations where I just want to like, you know, bulldoze or something and hurt yeah. feelings maybe, or like avoid hurting feelings. There's definitely times where, you know, if you know the other type that you're with and, and um, all the different, you know, qualities and attributes that are really helpful. Mm. to be able just to be a best partner with the two of you that you can be. Yes. Yeah. I love that. And I love that you even have a history with, um, Enneagram with, you know, your marriage and family therapy work long-term too, that you even have had, um, been able to rub shoulders with some of the greats in the Enneagram world. Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, yeah. Well, I taught, I was, my first teachings was, was Helen Palmer and David Daniels and Peter O'Hanahan was in there. And, um, and then Wow. I, yeah, I was living right in that area and I became a, I was a, a teacher's assistant for David Daniels. I just wanted to keep drinking up, you know, for the PhD program of the graduate school program. I was like, just let me just follow you like a puppy and keep going and, and anything that I could. So I did, I taught two classes with him. Oh my God. It was great. Yeah. Oh, what a dear. A dear. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. I love fun. that. And make sure you check in with Christine if you want to stay in touch with her. Um, you can send her a direct message here on Zoom because she's, like she said, she can, you know, take clients sometimes. Yeah, I put my information in the chat too. Okay. How to get in touch with me on my website. Thank you so much. Perfect, absolutely. And then um, I believe you also had yourself marked Kirsten, right? Yep, sure Wonderful. did. Wonderful. Yes, I'm um, Kirsten Barker, and I'm actually in the uh, Smoky Mountains, East Tennessee, um, near Knoxville. My little town's Oak Ridge is where I am, um, and I've been studying Enneagram for probably about eight years. Um, got started in actually in Las Vegas, Nevada. I saw somebody on here said they were in Las Vegas. I There's a huge Enneagram group in Las Vegas, if you do not know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Enneagram Las Vegas, uh, run by Steve Perdom. It's wonderful. There's like at least when I was there, there was over a hundred people, a lot of times at meetings, it was amazing. Um, but now I live in Tennessee. My husband is retired from the military and he and I teach classes together actually because of COVID it's been in our home. We're just kind of finally moving into a public mm -hmm. meeting now, but we've been doing that for a few years. Um, I was kind of what Christine said. I've got my whole family involved in my meetings, my parents, brother and sister-in-law, my sisters, I got an aunt, I got a cousin who drives an hour and a half to come to my meeting. So yeah. it's become a whole family affair. My husband co-teaches with me. Mm -hmm. um, and I've just gotten started on my website. I have it there on my name, Live Better with Enneagram. I also do Enneagram coaching. Um, again, mm -hmm. I will say the same thing as Christine, that it is for any kind of relationships. It's not, you know, it could be people trying to start a business together. I've also done a few sessions with small businesses going in and teaching all the employees about Enneagram and like how businesses function um, mm -hmm. better when they understand each other's Enneagram types and the bosses mm -hmm. understand 
their employees, you know, small businesses, about, you know, 10 to 12 employees or something like that so far. But, um, but yeah, I'm doing some coaching minds all on zoom meetings right now. So anybody who's anywhere can, um, certainly get in touch with me to check out my website, see if, you know, uh, you got type eight here, I'm a type two. So there's a little, all the bunch of us coaches that are of different types and different angles. So, um, you can surely see who you resonate with and, you know, it helps to have a person that you feel, um, you know, kind of comfortable with, and you want to get to know them a little bit too. Coaching is, is different. You know, Christine's a therapist. That's awesome. And she can do different things with you than I do as a coach. Um, I don't deal with trauma. I like to call, I like to think of myself as I like to help people prevent trauma. If you're mm -hmm. in trauma, go see a therapist and then come to me and then I'm going to help you. Hmm. You live better going forward from there. So, um, and I especially love working with young couples, um, newlyweds, engaged people, dating, mm -hmm. figuring out um, if that is, uh, you know, we, how to make that as healthy as it can be going forward and to go into your glow of marriage in a really, uh, or long-term relationship in the healthiest way that you can. But I do have to say my oldest clients are my parents who are in their mid seventies and they're relationship has drastically changed with Enneagram. So um, it, it's all ages can certainly benefit. They've been married 53 years. So, um, you know, if you want to talk to somebody, find one of us who are, you know, been through Christine's class, uh, Krista's class. There's just so much wonderful information we learned to help you to just be happy and healthy and, and have a great relationship with your spouse and with your parents and with your children and just I, I'm so passionate about Enneagram. It has changed my life, my marriage, um, my my relationship with my children. Both my children are very active also in Enneagram. Yes. And I just love it. So I'm happy to see all the people who are here um, on this conference today. So it's nice to see everybody. Yes, thank you, Kirsten. And she was on the podcast. So you can see her and her 2-8 marriage glow on the um on a podcast last season season three and your hubby loves it your your kids like you said you're bringing teens in and I'm just so happy because teen years are very rough and when you give them some sort of a, a framework again we do, said at the beginning we don't want to forget people's uniqueness or like make it you're an other person but it really helps to diffuse conflict um, I have oh so gosh. many teenagers that come to my groups I had 18 in my meeting last week and mm -hmm. half of them were teenagers and like oh, maybe early yeah. 20 you know college age students um and they they just love it and a lot of them are boys so people are like teenage boys they would be interested in this I'm like yes, oh yeah are. I'll tell you different. I got a lot of teenage boys that show up and want to know about this and want to get along with each other and get along with their girlfriends. And, you know, it's amazing. I'm really enjoying bringing this out into young people in the world. So, oh, thank you. Thank you. We need it and we appreciate it. And, um, you can go ahead and answer also in the, um, in the chat. And I'm just going to check if anybody else from the class wants to wave or wants to um, share. So I'm just taking a look and, and I see Catherine's waving. Would you like to share? No, I just wanted to wave and say hi to everyone. Oh. I'm not taking clients because I'm still employed and, uh, but I had a great time learning with Krista and Christine and Kirsten. And so it was a great time of uh, certification and but I use the Enneagram in my job to um, help pastors build teams and churches. And so um, that's basically the route I'm doing until I retire and start my practice. So, oh, well, I'm so glad that you're certified and that you are more importantly uh, just using this beautiful tool to help people to have hope when they're burnout, because often people in ministry burn out because they're just serving, serving, serving. So thank you for replenishing them and allowing them to rest. Um, so there's a few people here and I am just like so proud of you guys for making it through. Um, you know where my resources are, but let's talk types and let you guys just kind of let the information saturate. Um, and if you have to leave before that, that's fine, but I'm going to go through the nine types. Does anyone else have any questions before I do that? Anybody else have something on their mind that they just thought of as a question before I jump in? You can raise your hand or um, share it in the chat. And then Jen, you can just alert me. I didn't see anybody giving me hearts. Um, I think we were okay there. Were we balanced? 
Yeah, you did a good job balancing, Krista. I just want to shout out to this question here. What age do you recommend having your kids take an Enneagram test? I think it depends on the kid. Um, but a test for a kid who's literate would be uh, at about 10. I think they can do that. Um, and then if they are, you know, just struggling with literacy, that's okay too. If they're able to have enough wherewithal with understanding at least auditorily, then you could read them the test. Um, but under 10, I think it's hard to understand uh, some of the less concrete topics. So that would be my recommendation. And then I would say, hold it very lightly. And we recommend anybody, if you're just learning your type, hold it lightly. Um, and I think that's a good word for all of us. If we don't know, that's for sure our type. Um, even when we do know it's our type, we want, I kind of want you guys to know the goal is to expand so that you get to understand all the different types. So especially if it's a kid though, um, you know, keep it a little lighter. And uh, I know my daughter was about 12, one of them, when she learned and she thought she was a one, but she was a four. And that's made a really big difference in her development to learn that. But it came with time and it came with study um, occasionally. We didn't want to overwhelm her, but, you know, just chatting about it sometimes with your kids. And, you know, here I'm going to go through the nine types briefly and you can do it briefly. Say, can I just take five minutes with you and tell you about the nine types and see which one? So that way you don't have to go through a test. Um, but that's a great question about your kids and teens. And Kirsten might even have more to add in the chat. Um, so let me go through the nine types with you. Um, you're welcome. And the, I, I like to start one through nine. That's where I'm at with my brain. Um, but Type one is, I alluded to sometimes perfectionistic or the reformer, as I said, and they are really um, concerned that they're not always good and they struggle with feeling and fearing that they're bad. And so often their motivation is I, I've created my own little uh, mental rubric for what is right and wrong. And I'm pretty strict about it. Kind of have an overactive super ego in their brain and they have to come back to balance by remembering that they have grace and serenity and Everything is okay right now, but we can still try to make the world a better place. Um, and so I could go into detail on how that can work in marriage when they can be so hard on themselves or maybe their spouse, but my podcast will do that for you. Um, and we just recorded deep dives and I have all of these PDFs for you that are 30 pages on the Enneagram and marriage website. Also, if you really want a deep dive, because we go so deep type two is often thought of as a giver helper and they, in their marriages and in life, they just feel so good about sharing, but sometimes they think that their worth comes through giving and serving and that they might not be beloved if they don't give and serve. So they can really wear out and exhaust or manipulate in order to make sure that they get to give. And then they're like, I don't want to ask for my needs back. So they're trying to kind of um, cajole somebody into giving back to them. Um, but what they really end up needing to learn is you're beloved, no matter whether you give or not, you just are, of course, giving is good. And we want you to give, but give to yourself too. That's a good lesson for a two. Um, so if you're a helper, teacher, nurturer, you might be a two. Three is a love to perform and achieve and end up wearing a lot of masks. They're chameleons. They um, are just good at, you know, knowing how to be in a crowd and also knowing how to read a crowd. And so they can make great business people and um, celebrities and they can shine that glow in the darkness beautifully. But sometimes when they head back to the shadows or their family, um, they might not know how to live because they've been so hyped up and they might not know how to stop working because they've been feeling that the only way they were loved was also through that work. Um, and so their, their self-esteem can be wrapped up in that and getting to know themselves better is a great, great thing for them to do and, and moving in that space. Um, I also want to give you type four. They are people who struggle sometimes with really wondering if they, um, need to be unique and special in order to be loved. So they don't like to be grouped very much. It's even hard to type a four. Sometimes they really don't like to wear the same clothes as other people. 
Um, and I know that sounds very, like I just went very specific and nuanced, but it's kind of a pretty general thing about many fours. It's, you know, your clothes are what you wear. Fours are artists. So they're looking and usually very visual learners and they like textures. Often they move at a bit of a slower pace because they're taking things in texturally um, and analytically. And they spend a lot of time contemplating and in melancholy. So I was saying we can all go to our four space when we do that. And um, we have to be careful that we don't do that fundamental attribution error there of my spouse isn't loving, they're not doing good enough, but especially a four can spend a lot of time in envy. Um, and they're just worried, like maybe I'm not lovable um, and I'm not as good as others. So it's, it's important for them to know if they're a four so they can start, um, like I said, with that affirmation journal, finding ways to disprove that. Um, type fives are really observers or researchers a lot of the time, whereas fours are creative and artistic, so can fives be, but they're going to do it from an even more pulled back lens and they can be that person you didn't even know was in the room because they're so good at hiding um, and making themselves unobtrusive, but they're quite there and they do listen and lean in and they research and they innovate and they're brilliant. Um, but sometimes their just biggest fear is that they're inadequate or that they're going to completely run out of energy. And that makes them feel very afraid to give more than they take. Um, and in fact, they don't even want to take from others. They just want to keep resources so that they won't run out of their own resources or be called upon to do something that will become too taxing. Um, so of course they have to learn their synergy that comes with sharing. And then six is somebody who is beautiful at being loyal. They're called the befriender, the troubleshooter, sometimes the skeptic or the guardian. They are really nice people, caring people. Um, but they often have a, um, a push pull in this way that if you say tomato, they say tomato, they like to check on you and troubleshoot and trouble, you know, fact check, um, and, they usually have a, a fearful side and then kind of a going against authority side. And they really do long for somebody to tell them what to do because their deepest issue is about security. And that's why they're checking on all these things, but they're usually brilliant and they're just worrying so much that they're not allowing their amazing brains to be showcased. And I find that they're very humble spouses too. They usually give their spouse a lot of accolades. I spent a lot of time with the six this weekend, healthy six. And I was just in awe of how she was reverencing, uh, reverencing her husband and, you know, giving him a lot of accolades. And I thought he was fantabulous too, but, um, he, I was like, you're not aware of how amazing you are. And that is a theme I see with a lot of sixes. So I always want to encourage them to get to know themselves better, to realize that they, um, can spend time trusting themselves because they have a lot of good planning that they do. Um, and then of course, just like any thinking type of person who's overly analytical, sometimes they do have to back off from that planning, get anxiety help, things like that. Um, seven is next. I uh, identify as an Enneagram seven, also very analytical type, obviously. Um, always running, always moving, really uncomfortable being still. Um, kind of have to force a seven to be still unless you then catch them in a state where they've maybe overindulged and they're exhausted or, um, or maybe satiated themselves with food so much that they're sated and they're restful, but maybe because they struggle with this doing this gluttony of always moving and doing at least for me, I notice sometimes I will overdo even on the rest. And, and I don't mean like stay resting for hours. I mean, more, um, I find things like running restful <laughs> and then I want to run for hours. I don't, my body won't let me. Um, but the reason I know my body wouldn't let me is that I tested that theory out and it didn't let me. Um, and some other types, actually their body does. People tell you I'm a two, I do marathons. I'm like, I can't, um, but I like to move and my family knows that. Um, and so we like freedom and we feel like we have to carry the, 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 all of our own work and we can't trust anybody for that. So there's complexities with it, but suffice it to say a seven has to work on how do I try to manage this? What routes can I take that would slow me down a little bit? Um, so I take a lot of pauses today. I had to take a seven minute rest and then I gave myself another five minutes and that really helped. It was very hard to do. But when I need it, I, I need it. And especially I mentioned earlier, I had a cookie, so I really needed it. Um, type eight is very powerful. Type eight are leaders. They're dynamic. Um, they are 
extraordinarily organized, at least in some ways. And, and just like a one is perfectionistic in some ways, an eight is organized in some ways. Often they like um, very stark colors like blacks and whites. Um, they are very justice oriented and fair, but they also um, really do struggle with sometimes a bit like seven, taking things too much, too lustfully. Um, and, and even different from seven, they would more take it as dominating. And as Christine said earlier, sometimes maybe like, Hey, I'm going to steamroll because these aggressive, assertive types, three sevens and eights, there's a lot of energy there. And so there's just this tendency to move fast, to go hard and not to stop. So sometimes for an eight, they really have to, I talked to an Enneagram and fitness expert who's a marriage and family therapist. And she said, eights can burn themselves out the most on workouts. And I know even for my own father who was an eight and is now sadly gone, um, even when his hot, he was on hospice, he was at the YMCA every day and his nurses would come and say, where are you? And he was, I'm, I'm working out at the gym. Um, so <laughs> it's like, I mean, you're not going to tell an eight what to do if you ever have known an eight. Um, and then lastly, um, and, and before I say lastly, um, their concern is I don't want to be vulnerable. You know, let me do it because again, I can't trust anybody, but even worse than that, um, I can't allow myself to be open and exposed that I might be hurt. So they will choose to dominate. Um, and so, you know, there's going to be work that needs to be done there, um, to find places of safety, trust and healthy vulnerability. Cause they're quite loving underneath that. And then lastly, nine is definitely a last, but not least almost the crowning finish nines are just glorious in their power. I, I think of nines as solid oak trees in a lot of ways. And I, some people take the Enneagram as a tree. Um, just think of the nine as kind of over it all. And if you look at an Enneagram symbol, you see the nine is over it all because they espouse the traits of all types. And there's more power in a nine than any other type, um, at least. And I really believe this living with a nine and working with a lot of nines, it's a lot of stored energy. Um, but Urani Opai has, has said, you know, they may even have 30 times the strength of the other types. Um, so it's important that you understand that if they're not being heard, not being seen, which is a nine's worst fear, you might not get to see much of this. Um, but the underbelly of a nine is if I do speak up, you're not going to listen. And I just have a theory that um, a lot of nines were shushed as children, especially because I've raised a nine and I've watched myself and others shush her um, because, you know, don't be too much, don't be too much. And um, I think nines have learned you know, I better very loving, very peaceful. I better scale back. Um, so it's important to, when you know this, and this is another great way to work with your kids. She was very, very intelligent, very young, um, very young, a lot of nines. I mean, she was one years old banging on her sister's ballet class, you know, let me in. Um, and I'm, sh sh you know, not knowing she could understand and decipher a lot. I would imagine a lot of nines have that story from these young years. You're not allowed to use the scissors you know, bored to death because they're having to kind of dumb it down. But when you do love a nine as a spouse, man, is it beautiful to empower them because they really come alive when they feel heard and seen um, and that you're not going to leave them or not listen to them. And now they can make beautiful, big changes in the world with their strength. And they can not just become peacemakers, but revolutionaries. So that is Oh my gosh. And it's nine on the dot. Um, but I'm, I'm here if anyone has any questions, but I'm glad that we had that question come in so we could review all the types. Um, but thank you guys so much for listening and for just staying through that. Those who made it, um, so grateful. Is there any questions? Are there any questions? And you're welcome, Wendy. And I'm now putting together musical accountant is Wendy. Hello. Any questions that anybody has? one Krista and yeah. it's really excited I had no idea that this um workshop was going to be like this I thought it was about learning about the Enneagram yeah. and how to start the process so mm -hmm. um I'm wondering because you said it starts on Thursday I don't know where to go to get this information mm -hmm. and why are you only doing one more for the year Oh, you are so sweet. Well, this is because it's a really big deal. Like it's 350 pages of material, 12 weeks. Um, it's, you know, it does cost money. 
Um, but that's not really why I'm only doing it once for the year. That's because I'm a seven and I take on a lot. So I have to bide my time and I'm actually writing a book right now with an agent. Um, I do the podcast and I have clients, so I can't take any more clients. Um, and so that's why, but I love this so much. I squeeze it in anywhere I can in between my rest and self-care. And I'm just honored that you would even consider spending time with me. So thank you. So where do I learn how yes. to sign up for the class or is it too late to sign up for the class or? Um, no, you can still sign up, but Jen has the link. I, uh, I have it for you at enneagramandmarriage.com. And if you take a look, Jen, and you can share that, that would be awesome. I love if spending time with my students. You know, that teaches it in case I, like Thursday is real quick mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm thinking about making it an online thing and I've done that in the past. I mean, I'm pretty small, so it's not like I, Enneagram is still fairly small in the world in some ways, like meme wise, it's huge and everyone has a meme account for it, but like it's, there's not, I, I shouldn't say that there's a lot of Enneagram coaches nowadays, but it's still sort of small ish in the way that I'm still reachable through Jen. And so you can ask us like, Hey, can I take it through video? Because several of my students took it through video without being in the live teaching like this. So I'm still going to leave that on as well, that people can purchase that. But then we do interact when you take the certification essay, because anyone who goes through my course, I need to make sure that I can trust, not that we would share everything the same, because no two people are alike, but that they understand how to work with couples in the world, because that's really um, important that if I'm going to give an Enneagram and marriage certification that they've done the work, you know, to a normal degree. And it's nothing, it's not, uh, you know, it's not rocket science, but it's, it's caring work that is detailed. And I, you're sounding very enthusiastic. So I, I hope it's a good fit for you. That'd be wonderful. Um, and I definitely want to do more of this. So that is not the end of this kind of thing. That's just for those who want to become coaches for um, any Grim and Marriage. And for those who do, we have a monthly inner circle meeting. Every month I train them afterwards as well. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm actually a therapist and I do, I do marriage counseling. So I think this would be excellent to put into my practice. Oh my gosh. It's totally revolutionized the couple's work and created such joy amongst the couples I've worked with. I'm just so thankful. So I love that you might be doing it. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a question that they want to check in about or just say, hi, I feel like there's not many of us feel free to, you know, turn your mutes off if you want to say hi and stuff, but anybody else um, have a question? Oh, quick refresh on the one five blow benefits. You're struggling a little. Um, I would say that this is a very wise pairing. Um, one five is um, extremely intelligent, but they need a lot of help when it comes to date nights. Um, they need to get date night kits um, and they need to be intentional about that. Like buy date night packages like um, I'm looking at one right now on my shelf called Crated with Love. That's a company that sells game nights that you can just have as a structured night because people are always coming to one fives for advice and moral leadership, and they just need some time together, but they also need to know what should we do because they both like to know what they should do. So those date night kits are phenomenal. And in fact, it was a, um, a one five pairing that helped me to come up with the glow guides because you'll notice I have a section in my uh, glow guides. Those are my pairing uh, guides, which is called date night tips. And it was a one five pairing that said, we need date night tips. So that's what you need date nights once every week where you don't talk about problems and stress and you don't solve moral dilemmas of the world and you just relax in a structured way. Where were those, what did you say was date night kits? Where can you find them again? Um, the one I'm looking at on my shelf right now, I'm gonna get it. Um, it's called Created With Love, just one second. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I have the whole thing here, we did it, 
but that's like we have other issues as a one seven couple we kind of do more walking and moving dates because we like that but this one's called stranded in love as you can see and it has like a whole game box you can see I'm not a one because I did not put this back right but neither did my type one husband um and so there's just like a whole night where you like there's fun things you can do and a little bandana that you maybe have to wear a scarf. And it just, it makes you be a kid again and asks you questions like, um, you know, show me your look. What does your partner look like when they're watching a scary movie? And so that's, I mean, this is fun for any of us. Any of us would be like, oh, that sounds fun. You know, like these questions we can ask each other, but a one five really needs this. They need these prompts because they're very serious together. And they also like watching shows like maybe it's This Is Us, um, having their favorite snacks. They need to chill and rest together. So, you know, in between, I know you said you're having a hard time. Just say, let's have a low key night. No expectations. The type one says, I have no expectations except rest for you. Now, I'm just going to say this super briefly about all the types, but we're going to use five as the example. Just because a five likes to rest and pull back doesn't mean that when we do marriage work that we're going to immediately solve that about them. We're not here to solve about our spouses. We're here to meet them where they're at. So if they want to chill because they feel exhausted and they, they might die from too much interaction and engagement, then we're going to have a laying down date night where we literally lay down and watch movies and cuddle. Um, now we might the next day say, can we do something out? We just had a date night like that. But anyway, long answer to you, Wendy, but I hope that was helpful. So, okay. Anybody else before I sign off that has a question? Can't wait to read all the comments. <laughs> I'm such a reader. <laughs> you guys are like, go to bed. <laughs> like, no, I'm going to stay up and read all the comments. <laughs> Um, but anybody else have anything they want to share before we leave? I do. I would like to thank you, Krista, for putting all this together for yeah. us. You put so much time and effort into this and you put your heart into it. It was not just all in your head. So you really put your heart into it. And I know so many people will be blessed by this and have much more exciting Valentine's days, or even just more intentional Valentine's days, which is, we're just talking about romance all month long. And so mm -hmm. I just want to thank you for all the hard work you're putting out there in the world. You need to be recognized as well. So thank you, Krista. And yes, you need to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, you guys have a wonderful night. It was great to see you, to meet those of you I didn't know, and you have a great night too. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Rachel.